Again, good morning and happy new year to everybody. Uh, it's good to see some familiar faces. Uh, um, welcome. I am Adam Block, Chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. This open meeting of the uh, Needham Council of Economic Advisors is being conducted remotely, consistent with current state regulations, and is being recorded. Public access to this meeting does not ensure that there will be public participation unless required by law. This particular meeting will not have public comment. First, we'll confirm that all members of the uh, CEA are present. Um, uh, when I call your name uh, momentarily, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, for others participating in the meeting, including Tim and, and Lee, um, uh, um, uh, please be aware that other people are able to see you. Uh, anything that you say or state will be a matter of public record. All supporting materials for this meeting, including the agenda, uh, are available on the town's website at needhamma.gov, unless otherwise noted. Uh, note about the ground rules uh, for this meeting are designed to allow for an accurate public record. I'll introduce each of the speakers on our agenda and after they conclude their remarks, each board member will be asked uh, by name uh, for any comment, questions, or motions. If inadvertently the chair omits their name, if you could, before you speak, just to say your name, that will be helpful so we can maintain an accurate uh, record um, of the meeting uh, for our minutes. Um, back in morning, and again, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, just run through the roll call. Uh, uh, Stu? Here. Ag Very good. Uh, Glenn? Here. Excellent. Bill Day? Here. Excellent. Anne Marie Dowd? I don't hear or see. Is that Amy by phone? I'm trying to figure out if that's her. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll come back and see if, if that is her, in fact. Uh, Amy, uh, rather, uh, Anne-Marie, if that is you, we can't hear you. But um, if it's not you, then we look forward to solving that mystery. Uh, Lise. Here. Very good. Uh, uh, Virginia, we heard, was uh, out, and, uh, out of the state right now and not able to join. Um, Mo. Here. Bob Henschel. Here. Very good. That's the mystery. So that's Bob on the phone. Uh, Adam Meisner, I heard from, is not able to make this meeting. Uh, David. Here. Rick. Here. Matt. Here. Mike. Here. Tina. Here. Excellent. And then uh, others, uh, other town staff, um, Amy, our economic development manager. Here. Tim McDonald, uh, Needham Director of Public Health Services. Oh. Lee Newman, Director of Planning and Community Development. Here. Very good, I think we have everybody. Uh, um, at this time, uh, I'd like to move over to the minutes from December 2. We've had these for some time. Amy, thanks for preparing them so quickly and getting them out. Does anybody have any questions or comments or other notes or um, for the December minutes? Any discussion? Move adoption. I appreciate that. We have a motion to move adoption of the minutes. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call the vote. Uh, Stu. Approved. Glenn. Approved. Bill. Bill Day. He's on mute. Okay. Bill, you're on mute. Do you, uh, do you approve the minutes? We'll come back to Bill. And yes. Minutes. Oh, very good. Thanks, Excuse Bill. Me. No problem. Had some uh, housework to do. <laughs> uh, understandable. Uh, Anne Marie. Anne Marie, you're on mute. I don't. Yeah. Anne Marie, you there? 
I can't, we can't hear Anne-Marie, but I do note for the record that, uh, that she is present. Um, Lise? Yeah. Approve, yes. Virginia? That's uh, not here. Uh, Mo? Yes. Bob? Yes. David? Yes. Rick? Yes. Um, uh, Matt? Approved. Um, Mike? Approved. Tina? Yes. The chair is I as well. The, um, uh, the minutes pass unanimously. Thank you all very much. So um, as we ordinarily do at this time, I'd like to call on our uh, Director of uh, Public Health, Tim, for an update on, uh, on COVID and how we're doing here in Needham. Sure, thanks very much for having me. I appreciate uh, being able to talk to you. Uh, as I think most folks know, uh, COVID numbers are not in a great place uh, nationwide or in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Needham is um, not quite at its all-time peak in terms of average daily cases, but it's close. Uh, it peaked uh, a week and a half ago. Um, I expect this week when the data is released on Thursday, we will hit a new peak. Um, Needham is in Needham and a handful of Metro West communities are in uh, the yellow. A significant majority of the rest of the populated parts of the state are in the red. The entire North Shore, virtually all of the South Shore, the South Coast, a very significant chunk of Central Mass, pockets of Western Mass, obviously because such lower population density. Um, so Needham is in a comparatively good place, um, but that's not to say we're happy with where the numbers are. I think, unfortunately, a lot of people did not uh, sort of heed the directives and guidance that were put out about how to sort of celebrate the holiday safely. Um, a lot of people traveled, a lot of people gathered with uh, extended family or friends. Um, we're seeing that sort of spike happen um, over the last few days and, and, and really uh, this week we're seeing it. Um, you know, New Year's, between when we left the office on New Year's Eve and uh, New Year's Day, we got 30 cases. Um, that's a lot to come in in a very short time frame. Um, I think Massachusetts has, as I think most of the folks know on this call, uh, Governor Baker implemented some additional restrictions um, that moved uh, Massachusetts back a little bit. Um, the effect in Needham was comparatively modest because Needham didn't have a lot of sort of the entertainment venues or theaters that had capacity reduced significantly. Um, it did do some restrictions um, in restaurants, but most of the restrictions um, didn't actually apply to Needham uh, businesses because most businesses weren't having, uh, most restaurants weren't having people sit at the bar for food service. Only one uh, Needham restaurant was having people sit at the bar for food service. I think um, our concern as vaccination planning sort of kicks off um, is people have probably seen and heard that it's going slower than anticipated. Um, we still have not received any vaccine in Needham. Uh, Needham Pediatrics did receive some vaccine and, and did a number of its providers uh, and affiliated sort of community practices on the weekend. We anticipate we're going to receive vaccine on Thursday, uh, so it'd be tomorrow, I think, um, with the instruction that we cannot start vaccinating public safety agencies until Monday. Needham's going to take the lead uh, in vaccinating public safety for the towns of Dover and Medfield uh, with support from their communities, but Needham's going to take the lead in doing their public safety agencies. Um, we're part of a regional collaborative and we received about 80% of the vaccine we requested. So that's not ideal because we requested uh, all the vaccine we thought we would need for first responders. So getting 80% of it is not, um, would be nice to have gotten 100% of what we requested. Um, the state has committed to, to following up as soon as we use the vaccine to, to pushing out additional vaccine. So we're hopeful that'll uh, take place. We're getting a lot of questions in the public health department about um, non-COVID facing healthcare staff. Um, so um, your chiropractors, your um, physical therapists, your uh, dentists, that sort of thing. Um, and right now we don't have great information about how that's gonna work. We are um, hoping that we will be given vaccine and be able to, to vaccinate those folks and make it available to them. Whether the state will instead instruct them to go somewhere else or we'll give it to um, you know, CVS or Walgreens and say, go to CVS or Walgreens. Um, it's unclear, but our hope in Needham is um, we've been planning for this for a while. We've added a lot of per diem nurses. We've added a lot of volunteers to our medical reserve corps. 
we're hoping that we can um, get a lot of vaccine and push it out to a lot of people. Um, so right now they're doing sort of the middle part of phase one, which is public safety, which is anticipated to take two to three weeks. Then they'll do the latter part of uh, phase one, which is the, as I said, the non COVID facing healthcare workers. Um, and then we'll get into phase two. And I think phase two is potentially one of the things that's of interest to this group um, because phase two is um, individuals with, with two or more comorbidities or uh, high risk because of age. Um, but it also includes uh, early education and K to 12 workers, um, essentially critical workers in transit, grocery stores, utilities, food service, agriculture, sanitation, public works. Um, so it does include a significant chunk of the business community. It also includes adults 65 plus. Um, our, our hope and intention is to help vaccinate a significant portion of that, but the state hasn't made clear what role it will expect people to take on and when it will start pushing those out. It's been very um, deliberate about trying to have everyone start at the same time. So even though we're gonna get vaccine tomorrow, we're not allowed to start vaccinating first responders until Monday morning. Um, so the state is really trying to say, okay, we're doing this group from this period till this period, no one can start doing any other group until we specifically say so. Um, so that means, unfortunately, that a lot of people who have questions and say, you know, I'm in the end of phase one or I'm in phase two, when are you gonna have it for me? Why haven't I been able to schedule an appointment yet? Uh, the answer is that we don't have good data from the state and we will certainly make it available to people the, the moment we get it, but it's the type of thing where we expect, we're gonna say on a Thursday or Friday, we're having clinics on Monday sign up. Um, we don't think there's going to be, unfortunately, the ability to sign up six weeks in advance. An important thing to consider is that with vaccine, and right now the state to local public health is pushing out the Moderna vaccine, which is the vaccine that does not need to be kept ultra cold. Um, but it does require a second dose, as most of the vaccines do. This one, 28 days uh, after initial vaccination. So when we are getting to the point where we're working with, say, restaurants or um, grocery stores or things like that. We're going to have to make have a commitment from folks that, OK, we're vaccinating you on Monday the 1st. I don't know if Monday's the first in any month, but Monday the 1st. And then we need you to be able to be here at an appointment at the same time on Monday the 29th. Um, there's some wiggle room. It can be off by a day or two. but really we're trying to, to lock people into both days at the same time to make those logistics a little bit easier. Um, I have a couple other things I wanted to mention briefly. I don't know if we want to ask questions about vaccine because I know a lot of people are interested in that or if you want me to just get through one or two other points and then we can open up for all questions, Adam. Sure, the latter. Um, so I, I think people have seen and, and I appreciate the feedback that we received. Um, the town's public information officer, Cindy Gonzalez, um, was um, sort of the lead on it, but a lot of people on this call, Amy and, and others, um, did give feedback on some of the public messaging campaigns and some of the um, sandwich boards that we've put up downtown um, and some of the wraps that we have for uh, trash cans. Um, we also have large wraps that are uh, going on fences. I guess they're not wraps, I guess large banners um, that are putting, being put on fences around the parks and playgrounds um, with some simple messages about, you know, sort of the general theme is follow the rules now so we can have lots of fun later. Um, was the general idea. There's also a uh, social media ad, a media, um, an animated ad that we're going to send out over social media targeting youth, uh, essentially trying to sort of play up the idea of you might feel you're safe, but what about all these other people in your life who might be, might be vulnerable? Please think of them when you're making your decisions. Um, we're hopeful that's going to be something we can get out uh, either later this month or early February. Um, so those are sort of two things that I think are trying to be responsive to some of the things we've heard from, from the public and, and from, from the business groups about trying to remind residents about their responsibilities, trying to encourage them to be, to be responsible so that, that we can return to normal quickly or quicker than, than maybe we're on target to now. Um, so. That's, uh, that's helpful. Um, I can't imagine the challenge of, uh, you know, trying to roll out. We hear the challenge of rolling out the vaccine across uh, many jurisdictions throughout the country. Um, uh, does, I'll open this up if anyone has any specific questions. Uh, I 
I don't hear anyone, uh, but I do see someone on the phone. I don't know if that's Bob Henschel. Bob, are you uh, looking to ask a question to Tim? Um, no. Okay. David, uh, David looks like. Uh, David, go ahead. Thanks, Matt. Hi. Um, yeah, I was just curious about a couple things. One is, um, do we have any sense of the of the capacity in our own backyard at, at the hospital, um, and or and or Newton Wellesley, and, and sort of, is there any way that, um, it, to the extent that that is is indeed um, uh, anxiety producing, should we should we be trying to share that news as a as an inducement to following the rules? Um, and then the second question is, um, are there we hear uh, regularly now stories about the um, vaccine rollout being less than optimal in terms of on a, on a national level. And uh, wondering if there's any sign of that situation changing uh, of, of more resources being brought to bear. Sure, so um, I gotta be honest, um, Massachusetts is, and if you follow sort of the governor's reports, hospital um, usage is increasing, ICU uh, percentage of free ICU beds is decreasing. Um, it's not in the same space that California is in terms of significant levels of rationing of care already, especially Los Angeles County, um, but it's not, um, it's not ideal and it's certainly a cause for concern. Um, I haven't actually talked to, to BI about whether they'd be interested in publicizing it, although I think it's it's one of the ways to potentially drive home a, a very tangible and local reminder of like, these are the costs when you have a dinner party with nine people that aren't in your household. It means that the hospital has less capacity to care for somebody who has a heart attack, somebody who has a stroke, and, and that, you know, that could be your somebody, that could be someone in your family. Um, I, I'm happy to talk to them because maybe that is something they want to um, highlight and we'd be happy to sort of amplify that message with them um, because I do think if, um, I, I think I worry that sort of no one is listening anymore. I think everyone sort of understands what the right thing to do is, and and there's a large part of the populace that's complying with that, and there's a not minor minority that is not complying with it. And I think that the challenge is that that uh, minority is is driving the volume of cases we're seeing in Needham. Our cases are still largely driven by family and small social gatherings. We haven't had, you know, outbreaks at restaurants. We haven't had huge workplace outbreaks. We haven't had, um, you know, large outdoor parties or things like that. We're still seeing it, you know, somebody um, thinking things are still normal and taking off their mask and having, you know, lunch across the table with a coworker and then coming home and getting their spouse or their kids sick. Um, we're still seeing kids uh, getting sick outside of school, uh, you know, hanging out together, uh, playing on sports teams, we still haven't seen in school transmission, which is great. Um, but, but yeah, uh, so I, I'm happy to bring that back to BI and, and maybe Mo, uh, you can also help, um, help me with that and, and Kate and John Fogarty. Um, the second part of your question, I think um, there, there is slight improvement in vaccine distribution, there will be greater improvement, um, likely with the change of administration, just by virtue of the people that so far have been slated to staff agencies, knowing at least some of them in the sort of CDC and um, uh, HHS Assistant Secretary for Health and Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response in HHS, there's some very competent people that have been slated to come in. I think there's, it's hard to overstate the lack of sort of coordinating and centralizing role the federal government has had over the last year and the lack of funding that has been made available, the, the sort of complete lack of funding. So you think about most local public health and, and Massachusetts is unique in that it's done sort of at a city and town level. Most places it's done on a county level. Um, those communities have taken on, cities and towns and counties have taken on significant contact tracing responsibilities, which is not usually something that they do in this uh, on this scale um, and have had comparatively little funding to ramp up those services. Um, so the, the challenge is also then you, you, you sort of spread thin the, the limited resources you did have. And then you said, okay, by the way, those same people also have to do vaccination planning. Um, we feel 
pretty darn good about where we are in Needham. Needham is, is fortunate both to have significant resources that the town has committed and to have significant grant resources that uh, my staff and I have written and gotten over the years, um, especially in the last couple of months. So we feel like we're in a good place that, and our, our hope is essentially that when the state gives us vaccine, we will use it quickly and responsibly. And then the state will be like, oh, well, most people know what they're doing. We should give them some more. Um, and that's our hope is sort of how we can, we can, you know, we can be available to do uh, public school teachers. We can be available to do um, the employees of grocery stores, food service establishments, all those sort of critical infrastructure workers in the second phase and, and the, the folks with the high risk factors or the age risk factors. Um, so that's, that's sort of our plan. I guess I'm cautiously optimistic that things will get slightly better. I just don't think it's going to be a, a revolutionary change. Tim, I had heard that uh, um, that with kids uh, kind of spreading uh, in in town, that it's not necessarily the kids playing in the arena itself. It's uh, the sport. It's that they tend to gather afterwards. Is that true? So oftentimes it's very challenging to tell the exact point of exposure because the kids who are um, you know, playing hockey together are also in the locker room together, may also have carpooled together and are also in history class together. But in general, our sort of rule of, a, of assumption, and I feel it's a safe rule of assumption, is we look at the most risky sort of circumstances taken. So if you're in school, you know, the desks are five and a half to six feet apart. Everybody has masks on. The teacher doesn't let you take your mask off. Um, you know, and then you go down sort of through the line and it's like, oh, in the locker room, you hung out extra or your parents said it was okay that you go over your friend's house after the game for four hours. That's riskier than, you know, being on the ice at practice and being on the ice at practice is riskier than being in school. So our logical assumption is that, that a lot of the activities are, like you said, the carpooling, the hanging out after a game or a practice, even just um, parents and kids gathering kind of at the rink to sort of chit chat for 10 minutes while people get out of the locker room to then go home. They're, they're not, unfortunately, keeping that space all the time. Um, it's hard. I, I think when you're interacting with adults, I think it, it's, it's challenging to continually remind people of like, hey, you need to step back. Hey, you need to step back. People are, are social and they want to interact. And sometimes people don't always maintain that the distance that they should. Um, yeah, so I, it isn't necessarily the act of playing the sports. And um, uh, Dan Lee and Mike, uh, Dan Lee, the athletic director, Mike, the assistant athletic director in, in Needham came up with a really, really well thought out and detailed plan to sort of keep their athletes safe uh, and their coaches this winter season. Um, I reviewed it in depth. I was very comfortable with it. Um, but that doesn't control for people, you know, carpooling, people hanging out after. Uh, we had a situation with a high school athlete having um, some of his friends over to uh, weightlift in the place where he lived, had a, a sort of a gym with the complex, and they went over to weightlift for four or five hours. That's a risky thing, being in a, a fairly small apartment complex gym and weightlifting for three or four hours with five kids. Like, it's not surprising that we got COVID cases from that interaction. Even with a mask. Even with a mask. So you're talking, um, when we do contact tracing, unless you're talking about an N95 level mask, which is um, specifically fit tested and designed for healthcare workers in sort of the most um, challenging settings like uh, intubation procedures, ICU, things that would be aerosol generating procedures. So not even your primary care office in many cases. If you have an N95 mask, it, it changes it. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter what kind of mask you have on in terms of us doing close contact tracing. So if it's six feet, regardless of whether you have a cloth mask or a surgical mask on, if you're within six feet for a cumulative period of 15 minutes, you are a close contact and your likelihood of getting COVID is, is higher. And we think, you know, if, if Adam is someone who's positive with COVID and I've been within six feet of him for more than 15 minutes, even if I've had a mask on, I have to quarantine. Right. Well, I, you know, you've been such an integral part of our CEA meetings uh, since the outbreak in March, sharing information and being available for businesses um, to help devise, uh, you know, various accommodations. Um, and we're grateful for your effort. We, none of us, well, I shouldn't say that. I'll speak for myself. I was not aware 
of uh, of the depth and role that you that uh, the Department of Public Health plays in our community, and we're grateful and very appreciative for all of the hard work, especially given that each of the people that you're working with have multiple hats to wear at the same time, none of which is easier, you know, and uh, so thank you very much. You're welcome. If I could mention maybe two things briefly, we did receive uh, yesterday another fairly small grant, but um, if members of the, the CEA um, or just the member, members in general um, have ideas on additional public messaging campaigns or additional thoughts on how to sort of more effectively relay some of the message we've been trying to push, we have some additional funding to support you know, having a graphic designer, having translators, having, um, you know, printing done. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to, to either take that feedback directly or actually it might be better if, if we worked with Amy um, to, to gather it. Um, but Amy and I can work together. If, if people have ideas, we'd be happy to try to see some of them come to fruition. Hey, Tim, um, just a quick one on that. This is Stu Agler. Um, maybe there's something to do with the high school sports because, in, you know, in the, in the fall, the high school sports are at least mostly outdoors. Yep. And now you're getting into the season, right, where you're going to have more indoor sports that are allowable. And yep. obviously, there's got to be some concern there. I'm wondering if that might be a good place to use the fund. Yeah, I think I think some targeted messaging to parents. Um, as I did mention, though, I think um, I've been really impressed with what Dan Lee and Mike did. Um, they have a they came up with a really, really detailed plan. And I read a, a lot of plans. And so when I'm impressed at the size and detail of your plan, I think it's a good thing. Um, so I, I think they've set up good parameters, although, yes, reminding people about you can follow this to the letter of the law. And then if you carpool with three kids and let them take their masks off in the car, you undid all the good work that was done, you know, by a lot of people. Um, so, so certainly targeting some messaging like that. I know the superintendent um, and Aaron Seacott, the high school principal, would, would be happy to help with that. Thank you. Mo. Uh, two things. Uh, one, I would suggest that we think about a message about how to shop safely. Okay. And, you know, to try to incent people to continue to use the businesses, but show them how they can keep safe. Uh, okay. Secondly, I want to clarify, what was the ask with respect to the BI? So if I understood it correctly, and I'd love for someone to jump in, is potentially highlighting, David, um, the fact that uh, hospital capacity is is limited given the volume of cases and that people making decisions to, to sort of ignore guidance has very real and immediate um, you know, repercussions. It's sort of comforting, I think, for people to think that if they did have a heart attack, there's a hospital that's two and a half minutes away. But if that hospital is full, that, that's a little bit more intimidating. Is that uh, sort of the general idea where, where you're going, David? Yeah, and I think it's safe to assume that that's the case because Norwood Hospital is closed. It is. So the BI is functioning as a hospital for a region, and it's a small hospital. But um, we can verify the capacity, but I think it's a pretty safe assumption that they're getting close to capacity. Yeah, I, that is what I was suggesting. Um, I ha I would not like to name names, but I, I have a neighbor who who does not observe behavior, that, you know, protocols to my to our satisfaction, and yet she was quick to take her kid to the hospital immediately when he got hurt. Um, and he should. I mean, she should. He should get treated, right? But Yes, but it's kind of a little concerning that she doesn't see the, the connection there, but she's relying on the capacity, um, but she's not really helping us make sure that we continue to have the capacity. Uh, um, I just like to say on the on the high school sports thing, um, I have uh, one student, one of my kids is, is a high schooler who is attending school remotely. Um, and has been an athlete, is not an athlete right now um, because she's so concerned about, about the uh, COVID protocols. Mm -hmm. And I think adding your imprimatur, your department's imprimatur on what the high school uh, plan is would, would be a, a very helpful um, signal that this passes muster. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. That's a good point. I can talk to, to Dan Lee about that. I mean, I think they're, you know, I want to always caveat things and say that people have to, you know, balance risk and understand their own family situation and what they're comfortable with. Um, and the fact that I reviewed it and think it's good is no guarantee that it'll keep everyone from getting sick. It just is hopefully a pretty good guarantee that it's a, a good plan. It will keep most people from getting sick. Um, but I'm happy to talk to Dan Lee and sort of highlight that. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to jump in and talk about uh, uh, the, what's happening within uh, the business community more directly. Tina, I'd love uh, for you to kick this part off. Uh, how was um, uh, how was uh, uh, the holiday sales uh, for you and Lise? I'd also love to uh, hear from you after Tina as well on uh, a similar basis. So, Tina, over to you. Hi. Good morning. Um, we nailed it. It was amazing, like record-setting year. I really? think. Yeah, for people who, for the businesses that were able to figure out how to get through, I'm talking retail now, um, March, April, May, and strategize to get us through, get, you know, get themselves through Q4, which is typically the busiest quarter of um, the year for most retailers. Uh, you know, there was, it was a, it was a strong season for quite a few people. In town. What do you attribute that to in the face of such adversity? I think it's a combination of things. I think it's you, first of all, your business had to have solid legs to begin with, to withstand the closure. Um, I think that unfortunately, because so many businesses closed, definitely this was the case for us. Uh, it wiped out a lot of my competition. So, um, you know, that worked in our favor. Uh, I also think that the Needham, not only Needham, but uh, you know, we, we did see quite a few people come in to the shop from other communities. Um, I had a lot of people come in from weirdly Providence and uh, Boston, Cambridge, who just wanted to support, wanted to support small businesses this year. So, you know, it was sort of a combination of all of these things that, that helped us get through the push. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. Um, Lise, I'd love to hear uh, from you, uh, from other um, uh, uh, chamber uh, businesses and retailers, how the uh, holiday season was for them. Well, we had we have heard similar, you know, record-breaking days um, from some of the small merchants. Um, just the feedback from the local community rallying around the the local shops. I think messaging really did permeate from all different sources. Um, I did a little walk around the day after Christmas and um, to a person who, a merchant who posted something on our Facebook page, people came in asking about that item or, you know, somebody shared, you can get this gingerbread kit at Treat and then, you know, they were sold out. So um, people have asked us what our next plan is for that. We're going to keep it going. I actually have a meeting of uh, the Needham Business Alliance happening not this week, but next week um, or possibly the week after um, where we're going to figure out how to keep this going. We're just converting the page to Shop Dine Needham um, and we're going to allow businesses to continue to post their news and for people to continue to share their photos of their support and shopping. So I hope by our next meeting to have a tangible um, action steps for what we're going to do there. That's great. That's very good. Um, uh, Mike, I'd like to call on you and get a, an understanding of what's happening. Um, Rick will come to you after um, in the, uh, in the uh, commercial real estate sector. Here in Needham, um, <clears throat> month to month, we remain pretty much um, consistent, I think. Um, with our level of activity, it's not what it was, but there is activity. We, we signed a lease just before Christmas with a, um, a family law group that is moving from Newton into um, our building at 251st Ave in Needham. I'm told the family law is uh, very busy these days, given that some people have been cooped up together, but um, be that as may as a growth industry, you know, financial services, insurance law, they seem to be, um, you know, consistent consistently still looking for space. Um, I'm losing some of my tech tenants. Uh, one of them is basically consolidating in Boston. Another is uh, reducing in size and going further south. Um, so, you know, that's where I see a lot of the um, consolidation going on now. And I think that you'll likely see them as a, um, a sector, probably embracing more of the work from home going forward that you know, may reflect a reduction in their overall uh, space needs. Um, you know, people 
seem to like working from home. And the assumption is after the pandemic, you know, basically has been stabilized, there's going to be still a component because employers see that it is productive and that it can be done and the technology platforms support, you know, efficient work. So we're, uh, we're still busy in our lab um, sector in Cambridge. And, um, you know, I, again, I'm, we don't have a lot of product downtown, but again, consistent with, you know, my comments previously, it's been very slow in, in the downtown area as well. So most people, I think, and, you know, Rick can chime in too, um, think that this is basically where we're going to be at for the next six months or so until there is uh, the ability to um, move around more freely and people can feel more comfortable engaging in the workplace again. Understandable. Uh, Rick, Bob, love to hear some of your observations. Um, well, I, I can echo Mike. I, I, actually, Mike, I was visiting a, uh, a, uh, a tenant of yours over at 251st. By the way, you guys are doing a great job over there with, with the way the building is handled. Um, but uh, we've talked to various financial services firms because we're in the business of investing in real estate. And we, the, those are some of our clients. And uh, uh, we're getting the impression that the uh, work at home uh, situation is, is, is wearing very, very thin, that uh, they're, they're more than inviting workers to come back to the office uh, it seems like a handful of people are doing most of the work and that's not sitting well with, uh, with a, a number of the people in the, in, in the larger financial services groups. So, um, th there's a, there seems to be a push to get people, you know, safely, uh, back, uh, back into their, uh, back into their offices, at least in the suburbs. From an industrial standpoint, I'm beating the same drum as I have been. It's a very active market. Um, uh, we, uh, from a personal standpoint, uh, my company, uh, we, we, we sold our warehouse property down in Rhode Island on, uh, closed on December 18th. Uh, it was, you know, uh, pretty, pretty stiff competition, even for a Rhode Island, uh, real estate, which is, is, is not really comparable to, uh, what's going on in Massachusetts. And, uh, we have another property that, uh, we, uh, had put on the market that again, a lot of competition. Because uh, those those tenants um, are continually looking for space, um, they're renewing their their leases where they are. Uh, anything that has to do with delivery services or whatever is in in during this pandemic is doing very very well, and uh, we're also seeing on a much much larger scale the um, well I guess to name names the Amazons of this world the uh, the wayfarers of this world, they have plans going out as far as 2023, looking for sites to accommodate a million square feet of warehouse distribution. So um, the, the industrial market, at least the industrial warehouse distribution market is, uh, is doing you know, very, very well. Uh, pr uh, I'll add pr pricing is uh, the highest it's ever been in in my 30 plus years in the uh, in, in the real estate commercial real estate business, both both on uh, the value of the buildings and on uh, the rents that are that are being commanded. Wow, that's a good update. Um, Bob, do you have anything to uh, to add? Not sure if Bob Henschel's with us still. By phone or not? So, um, Mo, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Adam, just a quick Adam question. Either. Oh, go ahead. I'll yield. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, my my phone went in the auto mute for some weird reason. Um, yeah, I was just going to add to what Mike and Rick had to say. I, I did see some year-end market stats yesterday from Collier's, and you know. It was an historically bad year, um, market-wide. Um, absorption uh, for year-to-date was a negative almost 5 million square feet. Of course, most of that was from downtown. Um, the, the spike in vacancy went from, I think, about 8% year-end last year to uh, about 15% this year. Uh, so it, it's, it's not good. Um, you know, there, 
just in, of course, you know, uh, lab space is still the uh, still the uh, the media darling, um, uh, and it looks to me that uh, a lot of landlords are going to try to to get into that business, um, which of course is easier said than done. But um, you know that that seems to be one one bright spot. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm glad to hear that uh, uh, it was a good retail uh, quarter uh, in Needham. Um, it, just anecdotally, just from you know laying my eyeballs on things, it, it did appear that vacancy was up in, in downtown Needham. It, it did it appear to me that there's some additional empty storefront, so I'm glad to hear that uh, it wasn't all bad news. Uh, Mo, do you have? I have a question and then a, a brief uh, announcement, if, it, if you can call it an announcement. First, my question is, uh, does the departure of Harvard from Wellesley, would that facility and the size of it affect our market at all? And if so, is there anything we should be doing with respect to that? Mo, well, what facility? Is this the one be uh, next to the Toyota dealership? No, this is the one on Route 9 and 128. The Harvard oh, oh. headquarters. It's across from the Sun Life campus. Right. Yeah, right. they're moving. They're moving to Canton with uh, with uh, Tufts. The Reebok building. Wow. Wow. I mean, it, it will be a large block of space, uh, and there's a few of them in the market, and tenants who need certain sizes of space sort of travel 128 to find it because you know by definition those are the only places they could go, but. It'll compete with the uh, upper floors of uh, TripAdvisor, which is on the sublease market. It'll compete with what's left over at PTC, you know, the Boston Properties has. For a lot of our product, you know, we tend to do five and 10,000 square foot deals. So I don't think they're necessarily looking to, you know, divide down to that size. Um, it may not have a, a direct impact, but yeah, space in the market is always space in the market. So. Is there anything it's, we can uh, do to leverage that uh, pos our position in this, or public? I mean, the public side of this, the government governmental side. Is there anything we should be thinking about or doing with respect to this? One. I, go, go ahead, Mike. Uh, you know, just the operating expenses and property taxes are always sort of the the, the public's. You know. Yeah, so I'd love side to of... help you on that. But... <laughs> If, if you want to go there, but, uh, you know, just being competitive in terms of uh, operating expenses, uh, you know, we have some properties in Wellesley, you know, expenses there, I know, at least from the retail stuff we have are, are very high on, on, on the tax side, but, you know, that's really um, the only thing that I could immediately come to mind in terms of competing on. Um, How do we compare with respect to Wellesley on that issue? Wellesley taxes are high. I know that we have a couple of availabilities uh, on Central Street. Um, I don't have any office, well, we have some medical office, but I, I don't have any direct comparisons. I can certainly talk to some people and get some information, but my, my gut is that uh, Wellesley is, uh, is higher than Needham. So we may be a lower cost alternative to right. the extent that we can get that word out there, that would be good. If it's a triple net lease where they pay directly for the taxes, yes. If it's a gross lease where it's all embedded in whatever number you come up with, it's a little less of a, um, a factor. Which is the more typical? Net net or uh... on a larger requirement, it's usually a net because tenants t typically want to operate the building themselves. Landlords want to sort of have the certainty of what that um, that base rent number is going to be. For the smaller lease transactions that I was referring to that we do, they tend to be more gross leases. So, and that's one of the interesting things about this market is like even if rents remain stable, where landlords are still sort of losing money, if you will, if the operating expenses and taxes are going up because that's less net rent that they're collecting out of that, say, $35 rent that they were getting a couple of years ago versus the one in 2021. Okay, and then the other thing I have for, I don't know if I'll get a chance to say it later, is uh, we, we've made a decision to extend the free parking in the downtown for the first two hours through the fiscal year in the assumption that that's going to likely correspond roughly to the point where the pandemic is creating more, has declined enough to create more parking demand. Uh, and of course we will revisit that based on what's happening to the supply in the downtown. 
but at least for the time being, we're going to continue that program. And that will be messaged out, I'm sure, through Cindy. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Of course. Liz, you, you had your hand up a second ago. I had just a quick question for Mike Wilcox. Um, Mike, we're trying to connect with somebody at the Sheridan. Do you have any update on, or even a contact? I understand you've been trying to reach out to them as well. Or Yeah, they're closed. I know it's the one in Boston and the Peru is closed as well. Um, I had a contact um, of uh, email that I don't get a response back. Um, okay. I was told, I think maybe Amy told me that they are renewing their permits, which- Oh, okay. yes. Sandy Sincata may have contact information or Amy may have. I do. Actually, oh, Sandy great. shared it with me, so I can share that with you, Elise. Thank you, Amy. I would just add this. Uh, if I had the hotel, I'd renew the permits too. I just don't know necessarily whether they're going to be opening. You know, they're just preserving, obviously. Um, so- um, Homewoods is open next to me, as is uh, the Marriott um, Residence Inn, and they tend to have, um, from just looking at the parking lot, sort of very little sort of activity from what I can. When I Mike, can just, when, you, when you say permits, are you re referencing liquor license, basically? Yes. Yeah. Very helpful. Thank you. And uh, Lee's, uh, the chamber is expanding to incorporate um, uh, the well wealthy. Mm -hmm. uh, so we look forward to being able to hear more about what's happening, you know, on the commercial real estate sector, office space, and also the retail and so on. Do you want to, is there anything you want to add about that? We are very excited by that. Um, the board has put, the board of the Wellesley Chamber has put together a transition committee that they've picked. And we're having our first meeting with that committee next um, Tuesday. And so I'll have more to report on that. Excellent. So I so over the uh, Adam, oh, yes, go ahead. Excuse, excuse me, just uh, from uh, the perspective of the bank, Anita Bank's gone back to uh, appointment only banking, oh. uh, where we had been uh, ha had certain people in, but uh, uh, we've uh, just gone back to appointment banking in the last few weeks. Uh, most of the employees are working at home still as has been the case since uh, April, uh, just <clears throat> FYI. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you, Bill. Uh, for but that. busy, we are still busy. Good. Matt? And I've had, to, I've, I've had to utilize, I've gone to a drive up, I had to get a, uh, a few documents uh, notarized and it was done at the drive up. So uh, it's extended to that. They're, they've been, uh, pretty uh, strict about uh, adhering to uh, COVID followings. Good, thank you. Matt, did you have your hand up as well? Yeah, just, just meant, if it's helpful just to mention, you probably all know again that obviously with the stimulus package, what we're seeing is you know, you'll know you see more businesses again, potentially looking for a second round of their funding. Um, as Tina probably knows and others know, you know some of the, some of the retail and restaurant sectors have some more favorable um, opportunities if their revenues had decreased. So I suspect we might have, you know, maybe some of our Needham uh, businesses looking for some more funding. So we're seeing that. And then like the reason I have to jump at 10 is obviously with the runoffs last night, you know, we'll see what happens with, with some of the implications. We, we still don't think personally, I personally don't think there's gonna be significant changes even with the 50-50 Senate on like things like taxes and so forth, but clearly more than you would have seen if it stayed. Um, you know, Republican, so. Thank you for the update. And I know Amy is gonna be able to speak to some of the uh, state programs that may be available yeah. for local businesses as well, which we'll get to. Yeah, it um, sounds like today, right? There was some announcement on some, some guy, the governor had put out some things in the last day or so. Which is great, that's right. Um, I, one of the things that I wanna uh, um, uh, include going forward in our, in our meetings when we're talking about this are new are specific and new challenges that the business community is facing, and any new solutions to meet those uh, evolving challenges. Uh, I think it's been very helpful to understand what's happening, what the state of the commercial sector has been, and all contributed uh, uh, with what's happening in the uh, the real uh, the residential sector uh, to flesh out the picture a bit. I think it's also helpful that we become mindful of 
um, of uh, of specific challenges that businesses are facing and specific uh, solutions to meet those challenges, um, uh, which will uh, which I look forward to um, discussing in more detail as we continue throughout the year. Um, uh, I can turn this over now to Amy for an update. Uh, from our economic development manager, including an update on some of those programs we were just mentioning. Sure. Good morning. Um, I will keep this brief. Uh, I continue to be in touch with the small businesses to check in. Um, one of the things that's given me an excuse to sort of pop in and see folks, um, as Tim had mentioned, I've worked with Cindy Gonzalez, the public information officer, to um, help distribute some public information awareness campaign materials, including these nifty uh, decals that go on uh, the doors or front windows of businesses. So I've been walking around Needham Heights, Needham Center, Hersey, uh, just you know, asking folks to put them in their front windows um, that sort of goes along with the whole public messaging campaign. And it's given me an opportunity to check in to see how everybody's doing. And overall, the feedback on quarter four was very positive, um, not to um, repeat what Tina and, and Lisa already said, but everybody was overall very pleased with the outpouring of support from the community had, I think it was a large combination of social media messaging of, um, of, of people encouraging each other and, and wanting to see the small businesses continue to sustain. So that's that was really encouraging. Of course, now we're heading into what has always traditionally been the quietest time of year for uh, for retailers, the, the post-Christmas um, lull. And so um, I am a member of the Needham Business Alliance and I'll be attending um, Lisa's meeting coming up uh, very soon and we'll be you know, tackling um, some ideas on, on how to continue to keep the momentum. Uh, many of you already know that the governor announced recently $668 million in funding for small businesses in the form of grants. Um, many businesses that applied um, earlier in the fall that were not um, accepted, they automatically are going to be included in this next round is the January 15th deadline. They can receive up to $75,000 in funding uh, or three months of operating expenses to help cover payroll, mortgages, debt, um, that sort of other bills to help them get through the difficult months ahead. So I've already you know, distributed that information out to um, the small business community in Needham and I've already heard back from several of them um, looking for clarification or assistance. So I spent um, much of the day yesterday responding to those requests. Um, but the priority categories are restaurants and indoor recreation, um, gyms, uh, nail salons, barbershops, um, event support companies, and independent retailers. So uh, the support that has been uh, sought after for a long time is, is hopefully going to make its way to these uh, small businesses. And then there's a second round of PPP, the Payroll Protection Program, um, that is on the horizon as well. So um, as soon as I get word that that's a sure thing, I will be sure to distribute that out to the small businesses. Um, so, you know, always let them know of, of free resources and webinars, the Center for Women Enterprise, the Small Business Development Center, the SBA, International Downtown Group, you know, there's free webinars, free resources, um, you know, planned webinars aren't always easy for folks to go to, but um, there's a lot of resources available that if you have questions specific to grant applications or trying to get um, advice on you know, your tax return or you know, minimizing your overhead costs. Um, there's another organization called SCORE that's available. And certainly the chamber has had um, lots of um, great resources available for small businesses as well. Um, so uh, other things going on, um, thanks to Anne-Marie Dowd for making the introduction to me to Mariana McCormick, who is the Vice President of Business Development for Mass Development. I spent some time on the phone with her recently to uh, talk about ways in which um, the, or the organization can provide some resources to Needham. So I'm looking into some opportunities there. Um, after our last CEA meeting, we had a small meeting. Um, it was Adam Block, Adam Meisner, Rick Puttrush, and um, Mike Wilcox and I talking about how we might be able to uh, get Needham sort of in the running to attract more life sciences types of companies to, um, to Needham. So there's 
some things that we're following up um, there and that are also included in the CEA goals, um, which we'll get to shortly. And then as far as um, business updates, uh, just to follow up on what was already shared, we are experiencing a significant number of vacancies in, um, in, in Needham Center right now. We actually have six locations um, and then an additional two Chestnut Street um, further down Chestnut Street and then two Needham Heights in the Highland Ave area. Um, so we've got, those are street level retail, not office or industrial. And so I'm reaching out to the landlords. I've had a couple of good conversations already asking, you know, what's going on, what they're doing to, you know, try to fill these spaces, what I can do to help support their efforts. And then also seeking, um, you know, approval to be able to put things in the windows so that the space and spaces look sort of less vacant and less dreary, if you will. So public art or a mural, um, you know, maybe it's a combination of that and maybe some more public health messaging, but doing something so that we're not driving by or walking by and seeing sort of the brown paper in the window that, you know, ends up sort of creating this atmosphere of sort of dread. Um, we want to, you know, try to improve the aesthetics uh, of, of the area because it, it does impact the, you know, existing businesses. And so um, we're, we're working on that. And, um, that is all I have as far as, uh, as, as an update. That's uh, a pretty good uh, update. Um, you know, uh, you know, it's so critical that you're in contact directly with businesses um, and also with the landlords on vacant properties and so on. And hopefully the idea of public art and other public messaging um, uh, you know, can help because you're right, the aesthetic look can improve. Uh, this also goes back to a comment that um, that Mo uh, raised before about what you know what we can do in terms of uh, trying to be more competitive, for instance, with the Wellesley office market. And I and Mo, one comment on that is uh, we, Amy and I and Anne Marie uh, Dowd have been discussing ways that we can try and create some marketing material. Um, uh, and to talk to Cindy about how we can try and promote Needham as being a competitive place to work. Um, a large component of that is, uh, is office-based and lab-based activity, which involves getting more involved with the site selectors um, uh, with mass development and some other agencies. Obviously the brokerage community already knows what's available in Needham and other competing geographies because they're all connected to uh, the various real estate databases that brokers use. And yet I think if we, I think it would help us to have some market collateral marketing material uh, for us. One of the projects that I think Amy is gonna be working on is a, um, is a, 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 a brochure on uh, how to conduct business in Needham. So various kinds to synthesize what the, uh, the procedures are for various kinds of permits in a way that's very easy to digest, whether it's a business that's looking to set up a hair salon uh, uh, and other types of businesses. And Lee, uh, Amy may perhaps reach out to you and to other people in your department to try and um, get a clear understanding and to work with you a bit on that project if you're if your department's able to help a bit on that, that would be great. Um, uh, so that's one of the objectives that she's gonna have for this year. It's not gonna be an overnight thing. It'll take a bit of time. And so will this other marketing effort. Adam. Yes. Can we add in there that we should be looking to try to recruit minority owned businesses and to the extent that we can uh, access state programs that might give them a leg up? I think that is an absolutely great idea. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Amy, if you can uh, mark that down. So as part of that marketing effort, um, uh, we're including that as a priority. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Mike. I mean, and to the extent that we can identify sources that would help them. that would be Absolutely. And just to add, um, I think I may have mentioned in a previous meeting that um, I have attended a couple of webinars in specific. Um, the city of Somerville is, is doing some nice work um, on creating you know, venture loan funds to attract um, these types of businesses. And I was, uh, I've been in touch with the economic development director there to sort of, you know, see, see how we can replicate their efforts locally. Um, Adam, Anne-Marie has her hand up. Yes. 
I saw that. I was going to her next. Thank you. Anne Marie. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, thank you. Um, Amy, um, I'm glad you connected with Mariana and I sent you by LinkedIn um, um, an email from Mass Development about a new grant program they're running um, to communities to prepare public spaces and commercial districts, um, sort of like a placemaking grant for, yes. did you see that? Okay, good. Yes, thank you. Okay, because that might be, I mean, I, I saw that you can get up to $10,000 unmatched um, and then up to 50 if you do a, um, um, what do you call that? Um, one of those grant programs, um, place making. Like, no, what, what do you have to do to? The shared streets? Yeah, no, no, no. Um, no, I mean, you can get $10,000 from mass development um, with no match, but then if, if you want to get additional money, you have to go out and do one of those, um, I'm drawing a blank on the term, where you go out and put it on the internet and people respond, to, you raise money. Mm -hmm. Crowdsource. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, and I also owe you to set you up with um, my another person at mass development who can, um, Ed Starzik, who's the planner and knows all, all the other great programs they have. Um, Great. And, and Elise, if you're on there, it would be great if we could get, I'm trying to, my neighbor is John Rufo, and I know he's super busy with your organization, but I think he'd be really instrumental um, with Amy to sort of, you know, he's, he does a lot of work for Mass Development okay. on, um, on placemaking as an yes. architect, mm -hmm. you know, and he's done work in gateway cities for Mass Development. And I've, I've asked him to sort of think about as he's walking down into town, like some some things that he might be helpful to Lee or or um, Amy on some things that the town could um, put into play. I said, you know, you don't have to do like big architectural designs, but you know, what are your thoughts when you're coming into town? How do we make the town more pedestrian friendly and and you know, incent people to to walk around the the core the core of the downtown area and shop? So okay, I would love it if you could help get John Rufo involved. Yeah, I easily I can connect connect him with both Lee and Amy. Yeah, and it's not a heavy lift, you know. Yeah, he's always the first to volunteer for anything like that as a board director. Yeah, sure. I'll hmm. Amy. I'll just connect with you to find out how you want to go Perfect. about that. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so I, uh, uh, Anne Marie, I uh, and Amy and I. Um, met to uh, go over some uh, priorities for 2021. This is obviously a year of, uh, of recovery uh, and it's gonna be a pretty challenging recovery and it will probably be disproportionate in various areas. Um, we're mindful, most especially on the impact, particularly on our retail businesses so small business remains a top priority we see for the council uh, throughout this year. There are a few other priorities that, uh, that, we're, that we're focusing on. You've received, all of you have received these from Amy and uh, Amy, if you could resend these uh, to the whole council uh, this week, that would be helpful too. Uh, we haven't had any feedback from, from anyone. Um, so we intend to uh, uh, further refine these and eventually to uh, have a, a chair vice chair meeting with the select board to ensure that, that we're aligned with um, uh, the, the economic development objectives for the, uh, for the select board, for, for the town. Um, generally speaking, we have four core priorities. One is like I mentioned, the small business community uh, the second priority is uh, developing new business opportunities uh, for the town. Uh, a third priority is potentially reconstituting the CEA. And what we mean by that is we had had a number of uh, subcommittees in the past that, that did good work, that reached out directly to local businesses and derived uh, and received very specific feedback that we um, advocated and had been successful in 
uh, in our efforts in trying to create some meaningful change for business. And certainly Amy's efforts um, uh, uh, you know, are ongoing in, in that regard. She's meeting uh, almost every day, certainly every week with a number of businesses and is in constant contact with our business community. Um, uh, and that we would set some goals for the, for the subcommittees and that may mean that we don't necessarily meet as a full CEA every month. We still have to figure this out. We would like the subcommittees to continue to meet and then, uh, and then figure out a, a way to bring the whole of the CEA back together. And that perhaps through this kind of uh, restructure of the CEA that we can have a more a uh, higher level impact um, uh, during the recovery and to be able to provide an update uh, um, uh, town leadership on, uh, on the experience and what, uh, uh, what may be necessary to, uh, to advance these efforts. And the last priority is cluster-based economic development, which is an economic development strategy I, uh, that focuses on certain clusters that are uh, present in our economy as a whole. And then for us as a council and especially uh, the select board and probably a bit with the planning board to identify which are, what sectors are priority sectors for the economy um, uh, and what does it take to expand and grow certain, uh, certain ecosystems within the economy. Part of that is gonna be as a result of the work that Anne-Marie and I did um, with the Babson students in creating an inventory of, our, of all the businesses in town. Our first goal is to update and to complete that particular report. And, uh, and then we would analyze those trends and discuss opportunities to grow certain sectors. Um, so we would ultimately like to see uh, a subcommittee um, that deals with cluster-based economic development, another uh, subcommittee that's focused on new business opportunities. Part of that may include some marketing expertise that I know many of you on the council have. Um, so we can market, uh, find ways to market Needham as competitive uh, in both small business and large uh, and large commercial sectors, and then the and the third uh, subcommittee would be a small business uh, uh, committee, which we've had before. Uh, sometimes that's been focused on the downtown, and obviously the downtown is key. But we still have other small businesses we don't want to neglect throughout Needham. Um, so Amy will send. Uh, uh, this uh, list of our priorities out again. We'd love for everybody to take another look at it. If you have any specific comments, questions, or feedback, we'd, uh, Amy and I would love to, to hear from you. Um, and our goal is to shore this up, I think, uh, by the end of February, and obviously by then to be fully aligned with the select board. Uh, and uh, we'll keep you posted if and how things um, you know, in terms of the meeting schedule and who meets and what subcommittees. To that end, we will be looking for volunteers to participate meaningfully in, in these subcommittees. Um, so we'll talk to you uh, uh, as we progress with that kind of a rollout. Um, uh, David, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering if when you resend the, the list, Amy, could you list also the the proposed subcommittees that Adam has just mentioned because I I was following along but I don't see it on the list and it would be helpful to be thinking that through at the same time absolutely thanks thanks for the suggestion David um, does anybody have any questions or comments about uh, uh, these priorities or any other priorities that other people may have for the see is for the council so uh, without hearing any further comment, I'd like to now turn uh, to Lee Newman uh, to chat about uh, um, uh, business permits being issued and other activity that you're aware of. Lee. Sure. 
So um, at the planning board meeting on Monday evening, we finalized uh, the approval on Children's Hospital, um, and we anticipate that that special permit is going to get filed uh, either by the end of this week or the beginning of next week will enable Children's to move forward with their projects. Um, as a part of that decision, there was some mitigation, uh, traffic mitigation that Children's agreed to. Um, specifically, they'll be making some adjustments to the single timing at the Kendrick and Third Street intersection, as well as doing some relocation of the signal heads at that location. Um, and they've also going to give the town a, a, a donation of, I think, $30,000 for some additional improvements at that intersection. Additionally, they committed to um, doing some work on Third Avenue to better delineate um, the um, right turn on from Third Avenue um, onto Kendrick Street, which is also a condition of their permit. And the town is going to be getting $130,000 um, that will be um, used for I and I mitigation, um, which will be granted to the town at the time the building the occupancy permit for that project is is issued. Um, the Avery Manor project, which is a redevelopment in um, in Avery Square, is moving forward. Um, the developer has had some preliminary conversations with the fire department and the engineer engineering department to review. Um, a draft set of site plans in anticipation of filing that application with the planning board. So that project is proceeding. Um, and then in terms of the empty storefronts, I think um, I think it was Stacy's Juice Bar. We've had some inquiries. I think Amy has been working with, I think it's called Cookie Monsta, that's looking at that space, um, which would require permitting through the ZBA. So we've been coordinating that work. Um, the planning work that we're involved in is, is around Highway Commercial 1, and that is advancing according to schedule. And the goal, of course, is to have that on the warrant for the um, annual town meeting. Um, and so we, have been, we, we continue to work with Studio and I um, in developing the urban design plan. Um, at planning board members have been involved in that, and the planning board is going to be reviewing those draft drawings at its meeting next week, Thursday. And we're planning on holding a community meeting on February the 3rd uh, for the purpose of um, going back to the community, um, identifying what we understood their concerns to be at the close of town meeting when the article was defeated and following the community meeting that we held in January of last year, um, and to present to the community the modifications we've made to get feedback as to whether or not we have adequately addressed their issues. Um, and then following that meeting, the zoning will be finalized and we anticipate holding hearings on a zoning proposal in March, which would then be on the annual town meeting warrant. So the community meeting would be held on February the 3rd. We'll be reaching out to town meeting members, board members, um, and we'll be doing a mailing to um, the residents who live in the vicinity of Channel 5 and the Muzzy site. Um, and I know Adam has been working with the Heights Association, which is also going to help us market this um, community meeting, um, as well as a League of Women Voters. Thank you. Um, uh, one question. Uh, have you, um, the Garden Center uh, on, uh, on Great Plain, uh, that's uh, no longer, uh, is, um, do you anticipate a potential residential development there? Are we able to comment on that? I've had some preliminary conversations, but I think they're really not public at this point. Um, I mean, I, th I think there is some interest in looking at redevelopment on that site, um, perhaps as a mixed use development with, ho with housing and retail, which would require a rezoning um, or housing as a, as a singular use. Um, but those conversations have been very preliminary at this point. Thank you very much. Uh, Mo, I see your hand raised. Lee covered it, but I believe that lot is zoned residential, is it not, Lee? Carl. That lot is zoned residential. So in order to do mixed use development on that site, um, you would need to probably extend the uh, center business district zoning down to include it, um, which would be one option that would allow for a mixed use development there. Or they could look at, you know, a 40B application there, which would be straight housing, and they could do that without a rezoning. So there are, you know, opportunities um, um, that could be pursued, but they but they may require town action if they want to go forward with a mixed use development. And that it's public who owns that, rightly. Um, I mean, who who the ownership is transferred to? 
Yes. Yes. So that's, is that Dorenzo? Yes. So that's public information. Yes, that, that I understand is, is who the owner is. And, and they're a Needham-based developer. That's correct. I think I'll be able to say more um, in an open forum um, a couple, uh, probably a month and a half from now, but it, it, the conversations currently have been very preliminary. Is, excuse me. Is there some interest in town in mixed use development for that? The property is currently zoned um, residential, but it's right on the edge of the center business district. I think it would, I think it probably would make sense to extend that district down to include, to capture that property um, because it's sitting adjacent to basically the center business district. And then it's got the church on the other side. Right. Um, but, cur but currently it's zoned residential. Okay. But uh, what's the feeling in town though, uh, in the business community and people interested in downtown? Cause that's, that would be good for mixed use. Well, I leave it to them to respond. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I look forward to emails. <laughs> Mike, you had uh, your hand up. Yeah, just a point of clarification, Lee. Is this traffic mitigation only in connection with their first building and that um, when they come back for any future development that they have rights to on A Street and behind um, TripAdvisor on B Street, there would be the opportunity to engage with them again about um, mitigation. And, and secondly, is there any understanding now there's not peak traffic in the area, but uh, historically the fourth Ave intersection on Kendrick street has always been a uh, challenging turn uh, for people, particularly fourth Ave out to Kendrick taking a left and just wondering if there's any update on potential future signalization at that intersection. Okay, I'll take part of this question. I see that Tony Delgazo is also on the on the meeting, so I'll let him respond to I think your to your second question. In terms of the permit itself, it was basically designed to allow children to proceed with their building and the two office buildings um, with the mitigation that's embedded in this permit without without any modification to that. There are monitoring requirements that are embedded in this, which require that we look at their parking to make sure that it's adequate on the property. And we continue to monitor the impacts on 3rd and 4th Avenue. Uh, but the permit is basically structured to allow them to proceed with the hospital and the office buildings with the mitigation that's currently embedded in the underlying permit. Um, in terms of 4th Avenue, Tony, uh, you're on the call. Maybe you could answer that question. I think Tony left. Yeah, I think Tony is no oh. longer. Okay. <laughs> so we can reach out perhaps. Uh to get a little more information, Mike. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, does anybody else have any other business? I don't see anyone's uh, hands up, but give everyone another minute. Uh, all right, well, with that, um, Thank you all for participating today. Uh, we look forward to uh, an active and productive 2021. Um, at this time, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. A move. Do I can. Any uh, discussion? Hearing none, I will uh, call the roll. Um, and I... Uh, I believe a number of people have left, so I'll, uh, I'll uh, adjust the role. Uh, Bill? Agreed. Mo? Yes. David? Yes. Glenn? Yes. Please? Yes. Anne Marie? Yes. Tina? Yes. Mike? Yes. Did I miss anybody? The chair is an eye. We sit adjourned. Thank you all very much. Oh, and I look Stay forward. Stay safe. Thank you very much, Bill. Sorry, what were you saying? Stay safe. Stay safe. Thanks very much, everybody. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Thank you. <laughs>